Forty Days and Forty Nights by Keegan Wildman Wendell. Chapter 6. The Eighth Day of Ayer. Idiosyncrasies of the Flesh. The campground of Swanee Music Park became entirely too noisy for my taste. I had trouble sleeping because some people from across the way were blaring bad music all night. Ever since I was a wee child, I had this problem with noise, and these rowdy Swanee campers were unwittingly subjecting me to a familiar pet torment of mine. It's a medical condition called misophonia, an extreme sensitivity towards sound. There are a lot of things that have happened in my early life that have remained a mystery, but as I get older, I'm beginning to reflect on my personal story more deeply and gain a special insight by the grace of God. For instance, I went to public school from kindergarten, which was in the Broward County District, to first and second grade elementary school in Palm Beach County, Florida. One day after spring break, when I had the nicest time away from the agony of H.L. Johnson Elementary School in 1992, I had the hardest time trying to convince my parents to let me stay home, even though I was being told that it was time to go back to hell. Now that is probably a hyperbole, but there is no doubt that I did not enjoy going to school. When the bus took me to HL, I went along into the courtyard with all the other boys and girls. I walked to my classroom and stood outside by the door and let every one of my fellow students enter. I waited till everyone was in the classroom and the bell rang. And then I turned around and walked out of the courtyard and out to the bus loop and out off the school property. No one is going to force me to go to this weird school where I'm not comfortable for whatever reason I had at the time. I really didn't know what it was, but I was not going to line up into whatever abattoir they designed for us kids. I was young and naive, but I had my ideals, and I decided to walk three miles back to my house to face the consequences of my decision there. I lived between two villages, Royal Palm Beach and The Acreage. Royal Palm Beach is a typical suburban neighborhood, and The Acreage is a rural area similar to Loxahatchee. The welcome sign says it's an equestrian neighborhood, a neighborhood for horse lovers. Each house has an acre and a quarter of land. My family had no horses, but we did have a border collie by the name of Dallas. She was a beautiful and intelligent dog, and my dad, Kevin, gave her that name, Dallas. I walked past the Welcome to the Acreage sign, and I was feeling so much better about my day. I wasn't thinking about anything long term, I was just enjoying the freedom and the air and the nature of our beautiful countryhood. My dad and I ran around this neighborhood, as I mentioned before. And we also rode bicycles together and walked many times up and down this very street. There was a horse that we would see often and would come to us. My dad taught me how to say hello to him in his native tongue, the horse language. You go up to the horse and blow into his nostrils and he will blow back. Horses do this to each other as a way of saying hi. This horse that my dad introduced me to was named Mr. Ed. It may not have been the name his owner gave him, but it was the one my dad chose for him. My dad sang me the theme song from the TV show that he took his name from. A horse is a horse, of course, of course, and no one can talk to a horse, of course. That is, of course, unless the horse is the famous Mr. Ed. Go right to the source and ask the horse, he'll give you an answer that you'll endorse. He's always on a steady course. Talk to Mr. Ed. It was while I was singing this song to Mr. Ed, the friendly horse buddy of my dad and me, that I noticed a car driving down the way, then suddenly screeching to a halt on the side of the road. It was a fat man with a crew cut and a button-up shirt. The window was down and he was smoking a cigar. Here I am, this young boy, singing a goofy song from a 1960s sitcom to a horse, and I look over and see the principal of my school glaring at me with a cigar hanging from the side of his mouth. He looked more like a car salesman than a man in charge of an elementary school. He got out with a grunt and raised his hand out facing me with his fingers synchronized, motioning for me to cross the street. Come on, Keegan. I got in the car and he drove me back to the school where I sat in shame and someone from the school called my mother. Hello, Regina. We have good news. We found your son. To this day, I think the school handled this situation expertly. They didn't know my mom too well, or maybe they did. It was a long time ago. But I think if they did, this was the best way to cater to her manic personality. By waiting to see if they could find me first before informing her they screwed up by losing me, her seven-year-old son, 
They had the perfect blend of emotional oppositions to cancel each other out in order to minimize conflict with my mentally ill mother. So overall, my mother didn't give them a hard time over the matter, and surprisingly, she didn't give me one either. My dad and mom realized that something was off in me, and they decided that it would be best if they homeschooled me. Truthfully, my dad did most of the teaching, and my mom tried her best, but she wasn't very skilled at it. In that aspect, I'm ever thankful to my mother for her generosity in sacrificing her time to do something of which she was terrible. I recall her frustration at trying to capture my attention. She was provoked to tears and sometimes shouting over my unwillingness to listen to her teaching. So, my dad took on all the heavy lifting of my education. He taught me to read by utilizing Hooked on Phonics, and I had a blast learning to love the written word with my dad every day. Getting up early to exercise, then sitting down to a hot bowl of cereal and a cup of coffee, no cream and no sugar. These sessions included a fervent study of the Torah, the five books of Moshe, or Moses, and the rest of the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, followed by prayer and then hooked on phonics. Way later on, maybe 2019 or so, I began to reflect more on those times, and I often wondered what it was that caused me to despise going to H.L. Johnson so much. A few months after my parents took me out of school, the teacher invited my mother to ask me if I would like to come back to the classroom for one day for a Valentine's Day party. When I got to the classroom that day, she had me stand up in front of all the students and asked me if there was anything she did or if one of the students rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't know how to verbalize what was wrong, and so my last day in second grade was a pagan celebration of love. And I left that mundane lifestyle behind me, starting at age seven, and tread down the only path I knew was appropriate for me, thanks be to my weird parents and my all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere-at-once God, Yahovah. The issue of why I decided the school wasn't right for me remained a mystery for the longest time, until the Holy Spirit, that is the Spirit of Truth, pulled the veil from my eyes and revealed to me exactly who I am and what He designed me to be. I was created to be an artist, and a musician, and a person who pays an exorbitant amount of attention to detail, to encourage others by getting to know what makes them tick, and considering them more important than myself, to show them the love of Christ and the perfect love of Yahovah. I was made in the image and after the likeness of my dad, Kevin. And when I say that, I mean to make clear that God made me in the image and after the likeness of all my dad's positive attributes. Now, my dad was not the perfect godly role model. No one is except for Yahshua Messiah, because I also inherited a lot of bad habits from my dad. The love of alcohol over the consistent love and study of Christ, and a certain level of asocialist behaviors. I would isolate myself from my peers often. My dad didn't have any friends, just business partners, and I developed the same setup. No friends, just business partners, i.e. fellow musicians and drinkers. However, aside from these flaws, God gave me a dad who was gifted with words, who was a journalist, and also a man of boundless generosity, who desired to know people on the inside and not by the superficial. He enjoyed talking to people, and people enjoyed his company, because he was an excellent conversationalist. There were also positive behaviors I picked up from my mom. Although she had bipolar tendencies, there was a side that people couldn't resist about her. They loved the way she made them feel and appreciated her forthrightness. She was a loud New York hippie type and loved to let it all hang out, warts and everything pretty and not so lovely. She could quip with the best of them and cause strangers to smile and laugh. But she also wasn't afraid to yell. She wasn't afraid to stand up and tell someone that they were doing something immoral. She was an empath. She spoke for those who didn't have the courage. Those positive qualities are still with me today the positive qualities from my father and my mother. The negative qualities, the sinful nature of the flesh, have been nailed to the cross with Yahshua HaMashiach. Now, my mother was a loud person, and I love to read. And as of lately, when thinking about why I wanted to leave elementary school in 1992, I came to a pretty surprising conclusion, straight from the Holy Spirit. I have this medical condition, misophonia, but now I really think of it as a superpower. This superpower, misophonia, as I said earlier, is an extreme sensitivity towards sounds. The sounds that drive me mad the most are subwoofers, mouth noises like crunching and slobbering and wet teeth sucking noises, and helicopters, 
and people talking loudly when I'm trying to concentrate. My mom on the phone in the living room when I'm trying to read a Hardy Boys novel. So the light bulb moment came for me when I realized the reason why I wanted to get out of school in the second grade was because I had a hard time keeping up with the teacher in a classroom filled with noisy kids that wouldn't shut the F up. And now here I am trying to get to sleep in my Honda Suka, and I have some noisy kids and their terrible bassy music irritating me to the point of near madness. I'm hungry and tired, and I want to avoid thinking about oatmeal by going to sleep, but I can't. So I struggle to get up, and I get my bike out of the rain and reorganize my Honda Suka and leave earlier than when I was scheduled. I decided to drive straight through the night and see if I could make it to Cleveland, Tennessee. It was about 3 a.m. when I left Suwannee Music Camp. I was overwhelmingly tired, but I pushed through past the Florida and Georgia border. I kept going until my body couldn't take it anymore, and so I pulled into a gas station and got myself a treat of the free hot water, located near the coffee roasters. If you are looking for ideas on how to spice up your 40-day fast, I have a few simple water recipes for you. Refrigerated water for lunch and dinner, and iced water for dessert, and of course, hot water for breakfast. Back in my car, I reclined in my seat and put on a playlist of 1,000 hymns played by myriads of contemporary artists and bands. Regardless of the music playing, I still slept deeply because this music was inspired and gives glory to our creator. I had a lot of peace, that is, a lot of shalom. It was still dark out, and I rested well in the arms of my creator. I woke up a couple of hours later and continued my course up north. It was getting more cool outside the further along I went. I would entertain myself by practicing my voice and listening to music and then listening to sermons. I spent the whole day traveling up the state of Georgia and through the dreaded city traffic of Atlanta. There were a few breaks that I spent around the city before and after Atlanta where I took my bike out and did some laps to recharge my spaceship's battery. For your information, I call my human body a spaceship. You may think you know me and what kind of guy I am by looking at my spaceship, but that is only my exterior. My shell. Spaceships come in many sizes and colors, but there are generally two makes, male and female. People love to judge a person by the looks of the make and model of their particular spaceship, but fail to see the individual that controls the vessel. This idea is not new. It is actually thousands of years old. When Yahovah sent the prophet Shemuel to anoint the new king of Israel to replace King Shaul, the wicked Torah breaker, Shemuel was commanded by Yahovah to go to the tribe of Yishai because one of Yishai's sons was God's choice to be the ruler of Israel. Yishai presented his first son, Eliav, and immediately upon seeing Eliav, Shemuel thought to himself, The anointed of Yahovah is indeed before him. But Yahovah said to Shemuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have refused him. For not as man sees, for man looks at the eyes, but Yahovah looks at the heart. Other translations say the same thing, but by a different method, such as, Man judges by the outward appearance, but Athanai, the Lord, judges by the heart. So God is calling me to do the same. Actually, he calls everyone to do the same. That is, to follow his moral law, which is written into the DNA of all humankind. We all have a conscience that tells us when we are doing something wrong. For instance, when we lie, a smoke alarm goes off in a certain section of our brain, excluding soulless plants by the adversary Hasatan, psychopaths and narcissists, Akka, wolves and sheep clothing. All of us humans inherently know when we are violating God's moral code. His code is pretty simple, and it all hangs on the concept of perfect love. I cannot love a person if I am unfairly judging him based on appearances. Don't judge a book by its cover. That is an idiom, a cultural expression based on an absolute truth. Based on an absolute moralistic standard that most people agree is absolutely the right way to behave. You should always be kind to people because you never know what battle they are facing. That sounds nice on paper. It's a standard that any rational human being would agree is the right thing to do, but where did we get this idea? I submit to you that these moral standards do not come by natural selection or anything related to nature, but from the kingdom of heaven. People reject heaven by saying it is merely a human fantasy and that God and heaven are quote-unquote 
an evolutionary coping mechanism. But that quick dismissal doesn't quite cut it for many people. If you look back at ancient times, and even today for that matter, you can see that this world is clearly a dangerous place to be. And as for natural selection, with a man living in the quote-unquote prehistoric age, there is nothing in nature that can give him any idea that there must be a loving God who cares for him. He's too busy running away from predators and robbers and tumultuous and cataclysmic events. Our universe abides by this principle of ruthlessness and chaos that spans the whole of human history. It follows a sequence of permutations from chaos to disorder, followed by more chaos and more disorder ad nauseum. So there are literally zero natural stimuli in nature to cause man to develop a sense of unconditional love from a higher power. Unconditional love is holy. It is an abstraction implanted as a moral standard that supersedes the chaos and disorder of everyday life. It is not of this corrupted earth. It is from above, and man did not create the above, nor did he evolve to believe in God. Even the ancient Chinese or monotheists that believed that God in the above, the Shamaim in Hebrew, created us and the Shamaim, the heavens, plural. Haven is a related word to heaven. So heaven is a domain of peace, shalom, and safety, the domain of the master of the universe, Yahovah, the Most High. I tell people that love to get high that when they come to know the Most High, it is a natural high, and that you can't get higher than that. A high that delivers everything we have been chasing our whole lives. A high that gives us the peace that surpasses all human understanding. That starry beyond our wildest dreams type of peace from heaven. And the reverence of Yahovah through the gift of Yahshua HaMashiach. By the time I got to Cleveland, Tennessee, it was late in the night. I looked for a cheap motel. I didn't want to sleep under the glaring high-pressure sodium light bulbs. And the idea of taking a warm bath was giving me an anticipation of comfort I felt would be awesome. Maybe it would distract me from my hunger, and I could have a nice dessert of refrigerated ice water. I stopped at the first motel I saw. They were all booked up. I got back into my trusty Honda Suka and traveled a few minutes to the next motel down the street. This one had no vacancy as well. I went to another one, a Holiday Inn this time, which would be a bit of an upgrade. But they were packed too. I hypothesized that the reason all the hotels and motels in Cleveland, Tennessee, were not receiving guests was because Bob Cloud's congregation at Jacob's Tent had attracted a lot of attention from people around the nation and they were migrating from all areas of the country to come check out his church. I was considering just roughing it and sleeping in my car again, but then I found a motel called Heritage Inn. The Middle Eastern Indian owner was cooped up safely inside his little office. There was a door he walked out of. That must have been his sleeping quarters. He came to the window up front to check me in. It was maybe around midnight, and I had just woke him up. I bought a week's worth of a stay at his Heritage Inn for $300. He told me the rooms are non-smoking as he looked at me intently through the window. He was judging me by the looks of my spaceship already. Great, that's perfect, sir. I don't smoke. He gave me the key and told me it was for room 220. I rode my car around the circle of the building and tried to park alongside my assigned door. The parking spots were slanted at an angle and appeared to be somewhat aligned with each room number. However, I noticed that there was a car parked at my room number, room 220. I didn't think much of it because I was tired, so I just parked behind the offending car. I unlocked the door, and there was a woman laying in the bed. She was asleep but muttering under her breath, and the room smelled of a thick cloud aroma of cigarettes. I went back to the front office and knocked on the window for the owner and notified him. Embarrassed, he asked me for the room key back and this time walked with me to a different room, number 221. I told him the first room I walked into with the muttering lady smelled like cigarettes. He opened the door and walked into the room and turned on the lights and like a ninja with some nunchucks pulled out of thin air started hysterically spraying air freshener over every inch of the room. I told him that wasn't necessary, but he was adamant about doing this and continued to go to town with a fragrance canister, and when he was done, it really didn't make any difference. I got myself a nice bath started with some oatmeal powder. This stuff works wonders on my dermatographia. Did I tell you about dermatographia? It is Latin for writing on the skin. It's a rare skin condition I inherited from my mother, 
a negative attribute of which I have not been unburdened of as yet. But I am happy to proclaim the healing over my bipolar disorder inherited from my mother. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, I have been healed of all mental illness. Drugs are no longer necessary, and my brain chemicals are perfectly functioning in balance. Praise Yahshua. But I have the skin condition still. If you look up dermatographia, it certainly looks like a fun skin disorder to have. However, the pictures you will see display a condition that may be fun, but it's not what my mother had, and it's not what I have had since birth and still have now. It's worse. The pictures and videos you will find of people with the general form of dermatographia will happily exhibit its wonderful behaviors for you. They can take, say, a knitting quill and gently rub it across a forearm or anywhere on the spaceship, and within just a couple of moments, the skin where the quill touched will bubble up into whatever pattern they desire. Go ahead and look it up, and you will see a guy who got someone to design in bubbly detail the periodic table of elements on his backside. Maybe it's because my form of dermatographia isn't much to look at, or maybe it's just super rare, but I have found no pictures or any information or medical research regarding it. My mother actually died before accurately being diagnosed as having bipolar disorder, and of course she died before knowing what the mysterious constant old frenemy skin disorder of hers was. At the expense of grossing you out, I will just tell you that my life literally revolves around scratching my insanely itchy skin. I've went to many dermatologists, and they have prescribed different lotions and antihistamines, and none of them could ease my suffering. My disorder caused my peers to ridicule me all my life. I had a peculiar way of behaving and looking. When I was a kid, I would destroy my t-shirt because I would constantly pull at the neckline to scratch the skin underneath. And so many shirts would always be stretched out and become awkward looking. I wasn't aware of this until after I saw some old photos of myself. One picture in particular is of me with acne piles on my face and with a backwards baseball cap and my stretched out neckline t-shirt. I stand in front of the American flag with my middle finger of fate raised toward the viewer, which is myself, 30 plus year old viewer me. I also had weird habits of scratching body parts in public, and sometimes I would get mocked. Other times, coworkers would come up to me about it. One guy at the fresh market in Wellington who worked with me in the meat department, Enzo his name was, observed my constant discomfort. Keegan, you are always scratching your penis and your ass. What's wrong with you, brother? I was so used to the ridicule at this point in time that it no longer bothered me. But he was kind, so I told him that there was nothing I can do. That it's a congenital issue with no hope of cure, let alone treatment. Have you ever considered taking a trip to Israel and dunking your ass in the Dead Sea? I've heard people got healed there, brother. It's in the Bible. Memories of my dad reading to me from the Bible and the history of Yahshua came to mind. The idea of going to Israel just to jump into the Dead Sea and be healed forever of my skin condition, caused me to obsess about it. A few years later, I was working at a gas station, and a co-worker of mine, a crusty old lady, saw me itching. Keegan, did you forget to wear protection? Huh? What do you mean? Do you have crabs? Here we go again, I thought. I informed her, as I did to many different people many different times, of my skin condition. Her boyfriend happened to be there, and he came to shoot the breeze before it was time for her to leave as he worked right around the corner at an Italian restaurant. I looked him in his saddened eyes as I told him and his old gal friend that there is no cure. Around 2015 or so, my guitar teacher at the time, one of a few, was concerned with a technique of mine, my exceptionally bad habit of scratching myself during a lesson. Why do you do that? Are you okay? I gave him my usual litany over the matter. Suddenly, he sympathized and told me to set up an appointment with his general practitioner. His name is Dr. Alban Bacchus. He's an internist. He's a great doctor. Terrible guitar player, though. I wasn't positive it was going to help. Everyone thinks they have an idea on how to get my skin problem solved, but I went ahead and booked an appointment anyway. Dr. Alban Bacchus was the first doctor from my whole human history to inform me that the skin condition I have is called dermatographia. It's an autoimmune disorder. He told one of his nurses to hold up her arm. He scratched me with a stick and then he scratched his nurse. Then he pointed at the redness beneath my skin. See, you have the redness of histamine. He pointed at the nurse's arm, whereas my nurse does not. That is the writing on the skin you have. He informed me that it is a super rare condition and that most people have the first type I mentioned here previously. 
with the fun, bubbly Welson designs, and that, unfortunately, I have the worst. He prescribed me a bunch of medications by trial and error. None of them worked. But he also recommended aloe and oatmeal baths, which were temporary relievers of my discomfort. In my crappy motel bathroom in Cleveland, Tennessee, with its peeling paint and broken ceiling panels, I had a nice soothing oatmeal bath. I listened to some music playing and I relaxed for about 30 minutes or so. Then I got up and gently grabbed the shower curtain with my right hand as I stood. The next thing I saw was a tile with blood dripping onto it. I stared at this blood going in and out of focus. I kind of didn't know who I was or what happened. I was in limbo, and I was wondering whose blood that was on this square of tile I was looking at. Then I realized I was laying on the floor near the toilet. I must have had a fall. I breathed slowly through my nostrils and picked myself up while shouting a praise of joy for the Lord had saved me from straight up dying in some cheap motel in Cleveland, Tennessee, run by an aromatherapy trigger happy Middle Eastern Indian fella. So the lesson I learned is that if you are going on a 40-day fast and you want to take a nice warm bath, don't get up too quickly. A few days later, and I couldn't manage to get a hold of Bill Cloud. I wanted to see if I could set up a meeting. The phone numbers on his websites were unattended. So I spent my time at Heritage Inn in Cleveland, Tennessee, going through my daily routine of praying and Bible studying and exercising. I would take my bike out of my room and pedal around the building, which had slight inclinations and declinations. The rises were hard to get through, but I toughed it out anyway, breathing hard. I don't want to die of starvation before I accomplish the goals that are instilled into my heart of hearts. When Wednesday night came, I attended Bill Cloud's Bible and History lesson. I arrived a few hours early. I parked outside the front office and wasted time by reading a short story by F. Scott Fitzgerald. It was incredibly strange. He wrote it in his 20s, and you could see the formation of a godless rebel fascinated by the lust and deceits of worldly vainglory and riches. Suddenly, I remembered that I promised to God that I would not read literary works of fiction anymore and I decided that this will be the last work of fiction I will ever read. I will instead read books that will be of benefit to my edification of history and science and whatever is useful for the pursuit of knowledge that is power, and mostly important, the Bible, the basic instructions before leaving Earth, and any other materials that confirm the historicity of the Word of God. 